Hey guys, I uh, just want to talk uh, quickly today about uh, the 2004, or 2003 actually, I think it might have been, um, anyway, sometime around then, uh, to say 2003 for the sake of argument, the 2003 film Finding Nemo, no credits anywhere, must be somewhere, ah, here we are, uh, we'll do any pictures, pitch, Pixar Animation Studios, uh, executive producer John Lasseter, produced by Graham Walters, directed by, story by Andrew Stetton, and directed by Andrew Stetton. And if I can find the cast anywhere, oh. apologise for this. Doesn't appear to. That's the cast anywhere. Perhaps I should have thought this through before I turned the camera on. Is, uh, they're annoying, can't find the cast anywhere. Well, that's a rather lacklustre way to start the video. But anyway, I'm going to talk about this film uh, quickly today. Finding Nemo. This, by the way, is a really good DVD. You know, if you happen to be a fan of the film. Obviously, uh, if you don't like the film, then uh, I wouldn't recommend it. Uh, but if you like the film, this, is a, this particular DVD, two-disc collector's edition, is really good. Because what they do is uh, they incorporate the director commentary the uh, making of documentary and the deleted scenes all into one thing. Uh, it's basically just the director commentary and then at the appropriate time they will like cut to a bit of the making of documentary and uh, a couple of the deleted scenes like when they become appropriate to the, at what point of the film you're in. So it, it all becomes one thing, you don't have to like feed your way through the DVD to find the various things that are interesting, it's all in one kind of thing which is uh, really cool. I absolutely love Pixar. Uh, with the exception of Cars, I've l liked every single one of their films, uh, and I think at least uh, a couple of them, Toy Story and Wooly, uh, are absolutely outstanding masterpieces. Like they have their places, like two of my all-time favourite films. Uh, if it had been up to me, they would definitely have been nominated for the Academy Award for Best Picture uh, in the appropriate uh, years. But you know what the Academy's like with animated films. I possibly go as far to say that perhaps Wally would be my choice for this picture. Uh, Finding Nemo, I thought for a long time might be one of my all-time favourite films. I'm not so sure now. I think it's a good film. It's not an outstanding film, though. It definitely isn't, like, uh, a bad film, anyway. No, it's, it's not like Cars. Uh, I thought, you know, uh, Bugs Life and Monsters, Inc., I would say were okay. And this is just good, I think. I, I don't think it's outstanding. Uh, just going to quickly uh, talk today about uh, some of the good and the bad aspects of the film. Uh, first of all, let's uh, go through the good things. Uh, the animation is outstanding. Uh, very sort of nice, sort of colourful look to it. It's, uh, it's, it is more of a kids' film with uh, with all the colours and the uh, the uh, imagery and uh, the very sort of soft characters it has. It doesn't really have a villain in it, um, but certainly the animation is uh, some of the best. Uh, CGI animation I've ever seen. Uh, it might, even by animation standards, be Pixar's best film in that respect. Are a fish a particularly difficult thing to animate? Perhaps they are. They definitely are animated really well. Uh, Bruce the shark in particular looks really impressive. And it, it's just got that right kind of sort of balance of that sort of cartoony kind of look with, you know, the fish's eyes at the front of their face and obviously them having eyelids. And all. But also at the same time believing that this could be real. Like, outside of the eyes, they actually do look like clownfish, and, uh, blue tangs, and sharks, and, uh, seagulls, and whatever. I think back to A Bug's Life, uh, one of the problems I have with that film is, uh, you think of the circus bugs, in particular, uh, there's, like, what, about ten of them? Uh, they are all basically, like, one complete character. Like, they are just a group, the circus bugs. But you have to get to know them as ten characters, like, all at once, and I think... It was just too much to sort of juggle all these different characters alongside the other characters you had in the film, like the princess, Flick, um, Hopper, the various grasshoppers there. It, it, it was too much. There was too much character stuff uh, to have to keep track of uh, for, for such a short film. This film has almost as many characters as The Bug Life. You've got Marlin, you've got Dory, you've got Nemo, you've got um, the sharks, you've got uh, the other fish in that fish tank. Uh, you've got a couple of uh, human characters, you've got that pelican, you've got the seagulls, uh, and you've got various other minor characters. But they're all balanced really well, I think. I think they take the time to 
get to know the important characters in the film just long enough that you feel you know them, but not wasting too much time on the stories and progressing. I think the, the abundance of characters are judged really well. I feel I feel a sort of decent connection with each of the, uh, the sort of main characters in the film. That they each have their own sort of distinct things about their personality. So that was done really well. Uh, the pacing was good as well. It follows this kind of um, what you might call Alice in Wonderland type format of uh, this one distinct thing happens, uh, which has kind of its own sort of look and feel. Uh, that ends, and then we move on to a completely new sort of thing that has its own different kind of look and feel. There's a different kind of feel to every scene that happens in it, particularly in the Marlin and Dory side of the story, because there's like two stories in this film. There's the Marlin and Dory story, and then there's the Nemo and the Fish Tank story. And Dory one, it's very much a sort of adventure kind of story. Uh, you see like this one thing that has like this very sort of distinct look to it, and then you see something else that's completely different. It was all paced really well. Like you didn't feel like they were rushing through with all these different kind of scenes going on. There was just enough happening in each scene to feel that uh, you know, that scene had done its bit. Then you moved on. Uh, the character of Dory, I think, is uh, really good. Probably my favourite character in the film. I think she's uh, she's probably uh, one of the best comic relief characters I've ever seen in any film, certainly in a Pixar film. I try to think of I think of some comic relief characters in other Pixar films. I suppose Buzz in Toy Story in a way uh, it was pretty good. Bustling up, maybe he he actually was a very similar kind of role to Dory. This uh, sort of foolhardy character, sort of the sort of. Uh, Laurel and Hardy partnership of Carl and Russell, very similar to Marlon and Dory in Finding Nemo, actually. One of them has a bit more sense than the other, and the, the other's like a comic relief. A couple of uh, really good lines uh, she got in there, like when they're in the whale's mouth, uh, and Marlon says, the water's going down, look, it's half empty, and Dory says, hmm, I'd say it's half full. And they're wanting to ask this mysterious fish for directions, and Marlon says, no, we can't ask for directions, it could eat us and spit out our bones, and Dory says, what is it with men and asking for directions? But anyway, those are the good aspects of the film, just to sort of demonstrate I don't absolutely hate this film, because now I'm going to talk about some of the bad aspects of the film. First and foremost, you've got the title of the film, uh, Finding Nemo. Nemo, to me, isn't actually that important a character in this film. I don't know if uh, maybe they wanted to make Marlin and Nemo alongside one another, two equal sort of main characters. I kind of feel like they're trying to tell, like, two stories at the same time. You've got the Marlin trying to get to Nemo's story, and you've got uh, Nemo uh, in the fish tank type story. The Nemo in the fish tank story didn't really interest me that much. I didn't really feel like there was anything happening in that story uh, that was moving the plot forward, or that actually interested me, or I felt that we really needed to know. He just stays there in the fish tank, uh, and then abruptly escapes at the end of it. I mean, you've got Gil's plan to escape, uh, during that period of time, but that's never put into action. If it had been put into action, it might have been different, but since it's never put into action, and the way that Nemo escapes is a very sort of bang, Nemo escapes suddenly thing at the end of that, which you kind of feel like they could have just done straight away. Uh, I didn't really feel like there was anything that we saw in the events in the fish tank that we really needed to know about or we needed to see. I was actually kind of more interested in what Marlin and Dory were up to. I, I do remember very distinctly the first time I saw this film being a bit frustrated by that actually. Uh, every time they cut back to the fish tank I was kind of annoyed. I just wanted to know what Marlon and Dory are up to and the whole time we were watching things in the fish tank I was just constantly thinking about what Marlon and Dory were doing. I wanted to get back to them. Like uh, you could say that was maybe like half the film, perhaps slightly less, maybe about a third. just didn't interest me at all. I didn't feel it was in any way important. Which is kind of weird, given that Nemo's name is in the title. Uh, but in a way, I would almost just say that Nemo is a MacGuffin. He's not actually that important to the story. Perhaps that's taking things a bit too far. He's a little bit of a MacGuffin. He's not a complete MacGuffin. Maybe. And there's a uh, kind of difficult kind of issue. Nemo s says, uh, I hate you to Marlon, just before they're separated. In a way, I, I kind of like this. I like the fact that Pixar have decided to try something quite as uh, as serious as that uh, in a quote unquote kids film but to go as far as uh, you know actually have Nemo say I hate you 
felt it could have been dealt with a bit better. If it had been dealt with in the right way, I think it would have been really good and worked really well. I don't think it was done the right way. Marlin doesn't acknowledge it when Nemo says, I hate you. He doesn't really react to it. He just immediately just carries on with what he was doing. And then at the end, when they're reunited, Nemo, the first thing he... Basically, the first thing that Nemo says to him is, Dad, I don't hate you. But again, Marlin doesn't really acknowledge it. He's sort of like, yeah, whatever. You can't just, like, have a character, like, say I hate you, and then at the end say, I don't hate you. But there needs to be some sort of acknowledgement of it, some sort of meaning or reason to have it. Don't just have them say it and, you know, just assume that that's enough. Something, um, maybe demonstrate that Marlin, uh, felt uncomfortable about the idea that Nemo had said, I hate you to him. A few kind of, uh, minor points that, uh, kind of annoyed me. Uh, Dory apparently can read, and this is apparently something which not every fish in, within the context of, uh, this film actually has the ability to do. I mean, we assume that all fish have the ability to talk, they all have the intelligence of a human, but apparently they don't have the ability to read, or not all of them do, but because, you know, Marlin can't read, uh, and he's kind of surprised when he finds that Dory can read. So this obviously isn't something that all fish have the ability to do within the context of this film. Apparently Dory can. How is that the case? How, how has Dory learnt to read? Uh, why is it that she has this ability to read uh, when apparently none of the other fish do? And how is it that she can remember how to read because she suffers from short-term memory loss? That, that kind of annoyed me. I would like to have had some kind of explanation to the fact that Dory can read. The issue with Dala in the uh, fish tank, once again, it, it's, it's kind of really just to sort of, I guess maybe to give some sort of reason why we're watching the events in the fish tank, you know, it's not just a simple case of Nemo waiting to get out of the fish tank. There's actually some sort of uh, hazard, some reason that he has to get out of the fish tank within, like, this deadline or something. But then at the same time, the film kind of contradicts itself because we have Gil's plan for them to escape, uh, and then Nemo fails by being put in, like, grave danger. And Gil's like, oh, I'm so sorry, Nemo, I shouldn't have put you in danger, that's so selfish of me, that's so awful, but... You know, the thing is, if Nemo doesn't get out of the tank by the time that Dahl is going to be coming and collecting him, he's dead anyway, so isn't it worth the risk? Because Nemo kind of needs or wants to escape anyway, why, why do we need the whole thing with Dahl? Just, is it just like a sort of deadline thing? We have to get it just to create a bit of tension? Although I, I have to say... One thing that happens in the fish tank that does play a role uh, in the end of the film, you know, we do actually have, sort of, in a small way, the events in the fish tank acknowledged after we've left the fish tank, is uh, Gil teaches Nemo to swim down out of a net in order to escape, uh, and then he uses that later on. Which brings me quite nicely on to that scene with the uh, fish net and uh, Nemo's idea to save Dory. And this is obviously Marlin's test, has he learnt anything, because obviously he was overly protective of Nemo before, uh, and now they've been reunited, we have to sort of ask the question, well, has he learnt anything, is he going to continue to be overly protective of Nemo, or is he going to let him go off and do his own thing? And this was his test, you know, does he allow Nemo to do his thing to help save Dory, or does he just stay, keep hold of Nemo's hand or his fin and just let Dory captured. But the problem with it, uh, for me, is we can see quite clearly that uh, Nemo can swim in and out of uh, the holes in the net, so there doesn't really seem to be any kind of conflict here. If things go wrong, for example, with this fish net thing, Nemo could just swim back out of the net. Uh, you know, they've lost Dory, obviously, but uh, Nemo is perfectly fine, so I don't really see what the big deal with Nemo swimming into the net is, really. To be honest, Nemo doesn't really need to swim into the net at all. All he really needs to do is do basically what Marlin does uh, during this scene, which is just shout at the fish, you know, swim down, swim down, and you can escape. That's, that's all they really need to do. There's no real sort of danger to what Nemo is doing. So it's a nice idea, but it could have been better executed. They could have had uh, Nemo get captured in some way and then have to go back to save Dory from something maybe where it is kind of dangerous to go back and save Dory. I just talked about uh, the ending to the film, or more or less the ending. Talking about the uh, the opening to the film now, 
Uh, it left me very confused, to be honest. Uh, you see Marlin, you see Coral, you see they're planning to raise their children in this anemone. Uh, and then this Barracuda shows up, it attacks, Coral goes off and uh, tries to defend her children. And the screen goes blank. What's happened? All we really find out is that Marlin obviously has survived. One of the eggs has survived. We're not really told anything else. It's just a case that Coral has disappeared. The rest of the eggs have disappeared. The Barracuda has disappeared. We're not ex nothing is really explained. Uh, has the Barracuda taken pity on Marlin or something? Why has he decided to spare Marlin but not Coral? Why has the Barracuda decided to spare Marlin and one of the eggs? Where is it now? Is it going to come back? What has it done with Coral? Has it killed her? Has it eaten her? I suppose it must have done because we don't see her uh, for the rest of the film. I would like to have had some sort of explanation. I mean, this is like the, yeah, what is the word, the prologue to basically fill in the audience on what has happened. And yet it doesn't actually do a very good job of explaining what has happened. Or, on the other hand, you could argue maybe that's a minor point because what has happened to Coral and what has happened to the other eggs and why the Barracuda has decided to spare Marlin and one of the eggs isn't actually important in terms of what happens in the rest of the film. It definitely left me a bit annoyed the first time I watched this film that I was completely confused after just the first scene. Uh, and then a couple of general things that uh, I, w I would say are not reasons why this would, could ever be considered a bad film, but just why it wouldn't be considered an absolute masterpiece. I think of uh, Wally, and I think of that great image of him wandering around desolate earth with all the uh, mounds of trash that he's compacted, uh, and just playing with his tape recorder, and then back in his little sort of, uh, whatever it is, garage, hut thing, watching Hello Dolly on his screen, doing this like thing with his hands, and then holding Eve's hand later on. Such such a great image, and just the basic sort of look of Wally and Eve, with the sort of contrasting images, I think that's such a great image. I think of Toy Story, and I think of the, the scene of Buzz saying to infinity and beyond, and jumping off uh, Andy's bed, and going flying around the room, uh, and the eccentric and ridiculous way he behaves because he thinks he's really Buzz Lightyear. I think of Finding Nemo. I think of a couple of one-liners from Dory, maybe. Uh, I think, maybe, I guess, just generally of the fish in the film. There's nothing, there's no sort of distinct moment in the film, or no distinct image in the film that strikes me as being truly memorable. I think, oh, Finding Nemo, you remember that scene where it just, it just isn't there. It's not just the case with... Uh, with Pixar films that I think are great. I, th I think of other films that I remember fondly, Back to the Future, you think of Marty and that distinct red jacket and the DeLorean and Doc with his mad hair. I think of Terminator 2, I think of the T-1000 and uh, him climbing up the back of that car and that iconic chase scene. I think of North by Northwest, I think of Roger Thornhill being chased through that desolate field by that biplane and being gunned down like truly outstanding films, there's always like a distinct kind of image or scene that comes to mind when you think of it. That just for me, personally, is not the case with Finding Nemo. Just nothing really strikes me as being truly memorable. Uh, and by Pixar standards, I think the amazing thing about Pixar is they, they kind of push the boundaries. They, they do really kind of daring kind of ideas uh, that you would never think in a million years would actually work rat that can cook, a flying house suspended by balloons and old, with an old man living inside, a robot uh, on earth, like basically on his own just compacting trash uh, with little to no dialogue uh, throughout a lot of the large portions of the film. I would just never have considered in a million years before seeing those films that those kind of ideas would actually work, but they do. There's nothing like that in Finding Nemo though, it's a very sort of safe, very sort of basic kind of idea. Fish. Basically, that's all it is. Just a story about fish. It, it didn't have to be about fish. I guess they just decided fish would work the best. There's, there's 
there's nothing sort of really like pushing the boundaries about the idea of it. it's a very sort of basic kind of uh, father son adventure type story. I'm not saying that it's cliched or generic or anything. It's just nothing like really daring like you've become used to seeing in other Pixar films. Uh, so there you go. Just a few basic reasons why I think Finding Nemo is just a a good film, not an outstanding film. Okay, see ya.